dead hedge up the top is where we're going now because we're going to climb up this tree if we can the tree that we shot our video from last time is this one here but that's in almost full leaf so you won't be able to see very much from it best time to obviously see the ground plan of the areas of coppice you've, you've cut is before the trees get into leaf but I've been doing other things so we haven't done that so I'll use the ladder and trundle up to our left and see if we can get up this tree without falling out of it this wouldn't be a good plan right we're up the tree over there beyond that oak and that sweet chestnut is last year's cat see how small it is compared with this one this one is twice the size but then I only had to cut half the number of trees because this area nearest us was cut by my neighbours and not protected so that's that area there and you can see all the dead hedges and you can see this year's firewood and the remains of last year's firewood and this is the previous two years cant this is now three growing seasons old going into its fourth and this over here is one growing season old no, sorry no two growing seasons old going into its third and you can see the Dorset gate down here and this is the dead hedge the tree on the edge and the tree that wasn't cut because it was up against this thing and I thought it might fall out and squash me which wouldn't have been a good plan and you can see the difference between that area of bluebells you've got a drift along here and in this cant the bluebells are mostly showing in the gaps between the, the coppice stalls yeah because last year they got a little bit shaded under the coppice stalls and this year they're going to get more shaded they're still growing underneath the coppice stalls and if you go in there and have a look you can see them in the green but they're not flowering as, as much and they'll sit there trundling away until this is recut and then they'll flush again over there just in front of this big oak you can see which is the one we climbed up and looked down from on the last video we shot several years ago it was lower than this and easier to get into the shorter ladder but it's now hard to get to that area there hasn't done as well as this area here so it's about the same height partly because of the shading from this oak that you can see and the one beyond it which is actually on the boundary with the next area of count of coppice and you've also got shading from that tree over there and these ashes and this sycamore but that area along the bottom you can just see a dead hedge here that's the first area I did which was really small and was really hard going because there were lots of sycamore in that so that is one two three four five years work and the sixth year which I participated in but wasn't all my own work is beyond that just out of sight beyond the canopy of this tree and we've seen that before deer have been led into it and they've uh, damaged the bottoms of some of the stools but as it was three years before they were let in the actual regrowth is doing fine but it may not be worth very much when it comes to selling it we shall see well we're up here see this oak it's coming to leaf later than that oak and a lot later than that oak so that is genetic diversity between the oak trees and you can see all the nice mosses and things up on the on the branch tops and here you can see a branch failure let's go down and have a look at this oak from a distance right we're halfway up an oak tree I was standing 
on this one on my right, well, squatting. What I couldn't do was uh, look round at this area here, which is kind of three years coppice in this foreground. You can see as you go from right to left, coppice gets older and more branchy. And this area is all cut by my neighbours over several years and not protected from deer. So basically this coppice has got away best where they stack their brash. And that's fairly nice. But in between there's areas which got chewed for several years in a row. And they're all branchy and they're much smaller. Even though the age of the growth from cutting is the same. For instance, this one in the foreground and the one behind it. Foreground here. One behind it, that bigger dome. And that will affect the value of the coppice when it's recut. But from an age conservation point of view, yeah, this is quite nice. It's really dense, so there'll be birds nesting in it and foraging in it. And all this bramble which would be an absolute pain in the seeds for whoever comes and recuts it, if they can find anyone to recut it, because of the problems with the bramble and the problems with the quality of the regrowth, is nice and dense, and later on that'll flower and it'll produce fruits and be a resource for the wildlife. And in the dead hedge here, which is fairly thin, you can see it's been beefed up basically by the bramble growing. And you can see the bramble in this area here which I dead hedged last year, several years after it was cut. Fairly thin, but yeah, it's thick enough now. Bambi hasn't basically got very much of a run up because this is all so closely grown now. So that's the view from halfway up a tree. And over here, if you look at this dead hedge, you can see how wide and thick and dense that is. Even though the dead hedge itself, which is basically material from this cant on our left and material from this cant on our right is now growing up it was now sorry it's starting to uh, to break down so dead hedges last for five six years even if you put a lot of material into them because it's hazel it rots fairly quickly but even though it's starting to break down it's still nice and dense and this is much better habitat for nesting birds than a small discrete pile would be. Why is that? Because if you're a little bird, you can have your nest anywhere in this length, and you can also enter anywhere along that length, and you can trundle along in the hedge unseen to get to your nest. Whereas if you're in a discrete pile, you've got to go into that pile, and if there's a crow or something watching, it sees you go into that pile, it knows to look at that pile and search that pile. But if it sees you going into this long length with other material beside it, then even if it searches everywhere, it's much less likely to find your nest. So dead hedges as habitat. And my dead hedges are a lot less formal than other people's. There are no stakes in here because I'm cutting derelict coppice and then using all the material I can't use myself as firewood or as bean rods, etc., to make the dead hedges. In the foreground, you can just see we've got a coppice stool which was under the hedge, and that's growing up through it. And that would have been cut at the same time as these ones on the left. But it's smaller. Basically, there's been a shading effect by the hedge. That's the tree we were just up, and you can see that it is what we call stag-headed. So years ago, all the coppice around it was this high. It's all amongst the branches, and you can see where this uh, stool I didn't fell, because it would be too much like hard work, and there's a dead branch here. It might just come down and conked me. You can see that uh, it was all amongst the branches and basically everything below the height to which the coppice 
maxed out. So up here, has died off. So you've got a lot of dead wood in it. And what's happened is it forces the oak to make new growth from inside its canopy, what we call retrenchment growth. So you can see a lot of the original growth is fairly twisty and windy, but in the middle, you've got these stronger, straighter lengths. Hopefully this will pick this up. Got one there, for instance. It's easy to see when there's no leaves on it. It's happened to this one to a much lesser extent. And this one is a sweet chestnut, which behaves slightly differently anyway. But um, if you were managing this as coppice, I think I've said this before, I would think about starting to take down some of these standards. If there weren't any deer to worry about, once you've got it to this stage, what you're going to find is that in a good marsh year, these trees will produce a lot of acorns. Squirrels, squirrels and the jays will get some of them. But some of them will make their way to, to ground level and they'll germinate, produce seedlings. Some of those seedlings will go on to become saplings and you've got a shock of regrowth coming up just behind and alongside the, uh, the hazel. And that would make the trees, the oak trees, grow up fairly straight. You would then come along at year seven. Some of them will get cut because they'd be in the way, but some of them will get left and grow on. And again, the same process at year 14, maybe with a few more recruits. So by year 21, you've got some fairly nice large saplings, which then become your waivers. So they basically have a stay of execution. At that stage, you thin out. And at that stage, there won't be too much effect on the hazel coppice, which is your cash crop, your, your money crop, from the oak trees, which by that stage will be overtopping them. At that stage, this is 21 years from now, I would start to think about taking out some of these big oaks. In an ideal world, I would take out this one, leave that one, there's not very much timber value in him anyway. And as I say, in an ideal world, I'd leave that tree because it's full of dead wood, and full of rot, even though it's a, a sweet chestnut, a non-native, and has less species dependent upon it than the oak, over 300, apparently. But I would get up there with a tree surgeon and reduce the crown, which would make it more stable and would reduce the amount of shade that it casts and hence reduce the amount of competition that it has with the uh, coppice underneath. Then in uh, say another 50 years time, by which time I'll be long gone, it'll be time to take this tree out, possibly even that tree, or maybe that tree over there, or perm any one of these in this group here. So that in the long run, you've got two crops. You've got your hazel and you've got your oak. And your oak runs on a sort of generational time period. And I say that because the seedlings that happen now or in the next few years, if the deer don't get get them, will replace these and won't produce until I'm long gone. If I had any kids, their grandkids would be active by that time. And a lot of that long-term thinking doesn't seem to happen in British woodlands. It happens on the continent, especially in France with their oak woodlands, but not in the UK, which is a shame. Now I mentioned deer. Deer are the bogey in this, this scheme. There weren't any deer in this area from late Middle Ages all the way through until between the wars, when they started coming back in from the West Country and from over east of us, places like Cowdery Park. And they would have been roe deer, which is one of the two native species. Roe deer and red deer. Red deer we wouldn't have had around here. 
but in recent years we've got quite a lot of roe deer come back in and we've got a lot of seeker and if they get back in they will not only eat recut coppice they will eat seedlings including oak there's a video on the website about oak regeneration how it doesn't now grow on to produce trees like this so unless we control the deer if this is recut at year seven there won't be enough material to make these head dead hedges again so that means that unless fencing goes in or well, there's a huge cull producing less eight deers per square mile less than eight deer per square mile then all this will get eaten off and the seedlings and saplings of oak and maybe other species will also get eaten off so this is something that the uk government needs to think about needs to produce grant aid to help people manage their woodlands rather than just concentrating on planting trees we just had an election in this country local government and manifestos of all the parties mentioned, you'd have to dig for it, that they support planting trees. What about the woodlands and the trees we've already got? What in their manifestos exists to create, to uh, preserve and make better resources such as this? Things that have been going on in this woodland, which is ancient, since at least 1600 or before, and coppicing has been done for at least 3000 years. The wildlife value of this is far, far greater than freshly planted trees. The rate at which it um, captures carbon is far, far greater than freshly planted trees. I'll leave you that little point to think on. Shutting up now because I'm getting a bit cross. Thank you very much. Hope that was interesting. Oh, I was banging on a little bit a while ago. Um, earlier in this video, hopefully it'll turn out, about oak saplings and oak seedlings. Well, let's pretend these are oaks. They're not. They're sycamores. Sycamores have wing seeds, better powers of uh, dispersal, or obviously better powers of dispersal. Although things like jays and squirrels will move oak seedlings considerable distances into open ground. But anyway, sycamores, they do well under a canopy, and they cast a dense canopy themselves. But that has probably started about the time this was originally cut. This has been cut five growing seasons ago. And it's basically grown nice and tall and straight. And you can see the same thing would happen to an oak. Sycamores produce huge amounts of seeds every year. Oak, not so much. The old wise tale or the old guy's tale is this oak produces a good mast year every seven years or so and in between times yeah not so much as you can see in through here if this tree had produced a good mast year when this was first cut and leaving aside the issue of browsing from deer which doesn't appear to have been huge because those sycamores are nice and straight and the oaks that grew from seed in here would be less than half the size of those um, sycamore saplings. So basically the idea would be not to cut them when you cut this area here, but as you're working in winter, you'd have to look sharp to see them and find them. And as time goes on, they grow up and eventually take the place of trees like this one here.